Well, good morning and welcome again to Calvary Assembly Online. I'm really glad that you're able to join us today. Just before we dive into scripture, I actually wanted to give you a brief update on some of our expansion. You know, we're in a big project, and the good news is, for the last couple of weeks, a lot of progress has been made. And uh, not using the facility actually freed up some time for those who were constructing. Uh, as you may have heard, uh, New York has paused all non-essential construction. And so right now, uh, we are in pause mode. And um, we understand that that's to help stop the spread of this virus. And so we want to do our part in that. But progress continues to be made. And uh, we're looking forward to the day when we can all gather together and, and a very new and exciting space for us. Um, this morning, I'd like to talk for a few minutes about how should a follower of Jesus think about miracles? Some people think that that's something that is of a, an old bygone era, and others think that it's something that uh, happens every time we wish it to happen. Uh, what does Scripture give us in terms of an insight about this? And I'd like us to look at that this morning. We're going to be in, in Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 11. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. And as he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the bier where they were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still, and he said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help us. This news spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. It's a great story. Uh, the passage shows what a truly desperate situation looks like. A young man has died. Um, there's always something unsettling when death comes to the young. It's also to a family that the, the, this is the only son. And on top of that, his mother is a widow, which means that she has already known a significant amount of loss and grief. In the Bible, the there's often a connection between widows and the poor. You hear them linked together in lots of phrases because if you were a widow in the ancient world, you had virtually no power and virtually no rights. And without a husband and without a son, you had virtually no future. Our culture is surrounded by death. I'm not just referring to the COVID-19 virus that has become a global pandemic. I'm, I'm referring to the fact that every time life is kind of paused or dulled or stopped, we understand that some measure of death has inserted itself in. Everything that is broken, everything that, that feels less than, we're seeing death break in. And what's interesting is that Jesus actually moves towards this funeral procession, which is a point that I'd like us to see. Jesus moves towards the things we would rather avoid. Uh, Jesus' heart goes out to this woman and to her loss, and to her grief. He sees her tears. And you would think that Jesus, who ministers as much as he does to the poor and to the, the ill and to those who are, are so disconnected from resources in life, that, that he would get a little bit um, just distant and, and his emotions would kind of flatten out. It's so hard to keep investing emotionally. But his heart does go out for this woman. He draws near to her. And we're stunned at what captures the attention of Jesus. It's actually the poor and the powerless and the ill and the weak. In our culture, it's, cele it's the celebrities and it's the, the wealthy and it's the well-connected. We stop and we take out our phones to take pictures of them. But Jesus stops when he sees this widow who's lost her only son and her life is devastated. And he notices and moves towards the things that we would rather avoid. Jesus also interrupts the things that we cannot avoid. We don't schedule the kinds of things that Jesus does. 
By the way, we don't schedule the kinds of things we would prefer to avoid either. Um, no one plans to have a funeral today, but it happens. And so this woman can't avoid the situation that she's in. But he stops the funeral procession. And he actually touches the cart that they are carrying his body on. And, uh, and people, when they see this, they can think this is a horrible intrusion. Uh, who is this person that's stopping this conversation from taking place or th this procession from taking place? But there are others who could see it as an opportunity. Maybe God is going to do something remarkable. That brings us to this point, and that is that pretending and believing are not the same thing. Some people see faith or belief as something that you're just, it's a, it's a mental game. It's, it's, a, it's a thing that you pretend or hope will happen, but it's far more than that. Jesus goes to this woman and he tells her to stop crying, which, by the way, happens a lot to people when they are grieving. People go to them and they say, you need to stop crying now, and, and it's because we're uncomfortable with the grief. Jesus doesn't ask her to stop crying because he's uncomfortable with her tears or her fears. He asks her to stop crying because he knows what he's about to do. We don't have to hide our emotions from God. Um, what is feeling like it's dying for you in your life right now? Maybe it's something in terms of relationships or something in terms of your economic future. You don't have to hide your feelings from God. You can pour your heart out to him. And the God of power is actually attracted to the powerless. And the God of health is attracted to those who are sick and ill. And the God of life is attracted to those who are dying. And the God of strength is attracted to those who are weak. God is not uncomfortable in the presence of those things. Those things are uncomfortable in the presence of God. So Jesus actually approached another death. It was his own. He absorbed the punishment for sin. He endured darkness. He entered into suffering. And just like this woman, when she received her son back to life, it changed her life. It didn't just stop the grief of the moment. Her whole economic future changed because now she had a son. Well, when Jesus died and rose from the dead, he changed our lives too, forever. The presence of Jesus is what actually gives us hope. Uh, when you're sick, you usually go to some medical professionals uh, because you have hope that they're able to relieve the pain or uh, help you recover from a disease. And even when medical technology has bumped up against its limits, we still seek the wisdom and the counsel of medical professionals because we hope they can slow the process or buy us some time. And there's hope in that. All hope basically comes in one of two forms. The, the first is hope in something, and the second is hope in someone. Uh, everything we hope for, if it's a thing, will eventually disappoint us. Uh, things have a shelf life. They, they have an expiration date. They're, they can only go so long and so far. Uh, but if you hope in someone, that's a very different thing. Uh, some people are actually afraid to hope. Um, they're afraid the, of the disappointment that will come. They're afraid of how it will affect their life. In fact, one of my favorite movies is called The, the Shawshank Redemption. And there's a character that's played by Morgan Freeman in that movie. And in that movie, he tells us that hope is a dangerous thing. It will break your heart. And that can happen to people. If your hope is in something, you will be disappointed. If your hope is in Jesus, you will never be disappointed. Our hope is in Christ because he can give, not just because he can give us what we want, but because he's present with us. Our hope is in Jesus because he's with us always, because he is drawn to us, because he comes and interrupts our processions. With Jesus, anything is possible. Which just leads me to one more thing I want to call to your attention, and that is living with hope is just a better way to live. I'm sure you've been around people who seem to be absent of hope completely. And there seems to be a weight uh, that they bring to the world, a burden to be borne. But those who come into a room with hope, they actually help lift the burdens of those who are in the room. Well, God has come to help us. That's what all the people say at the end of this miracle. 
They recognize that God has come to help us, and that's what hope-filled people do, is they help those who are around them come to the realization God has come to help us. There are two large crowds in our world. There are those who are in processions, heading and experiencing a lot of grief and a lot of loss. And then there are those who are following Jesus. And these crowds are often brought together. And the question I have for you is, are you willing to follow where Jesus leads you? Because he led his crowd to interrupt a procession of grief and loss and to help individuals experience the life and light that he brings. That's what I'm hoping that we can do. In fact, I'd like you just to join me in prayer right now. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, the simple truth is there's a lot of grief and a lot of worry in our world right now. There are people who are struggling, and they're not sure how the future is going to look for them or how they're going to get through the current situation. When we interact with them, would you help us be part of the crowd that brings hope? That we have a sense that you are at work, that God is here to help us, and that we can help lighten the load and the burdens for others. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, there's one other interruption I think I'd like to call to your attention, and that's the interruption of generosity. I'm sure a lot of people were put off when Jesus interrupted a funeral procession. Of course, the outcome was really good. I think in the culture in which we live in right now, in which there's, there's so much fear and a desire to take even more than we need, uh, because that's what we're afraid things could run out and, and we won't have enough. Uh, I'm in the store and I, I see lots of signs that say, you know, uh, it's limited to one or two items. And I think God has come to interrupt the crowd that's in the procession of fear and trying to hang on to and grab a hold of so much. And I think he's calling us to open our hearts and open our hands and let go. I think that that's how we bring hope in our world. Our world will never experience hope by what we grab and hold on to, but our world will experience hope when we're willing to open our hands and our heart and let go. So I'm asking that you would do that today. In fact, you can, you can go online right now, and you can go to rcalvary.org forward slash give, and you can exercise generosity. Thank you.